Thank you, Chairman Royce and Ranking Member Engel, for calling this hearing. Let me be absolutely clear. The international community cannot permit Iran to obtain nuclear weapons capability, and every, every option must remain on the table to ensure that it does not. This conflict will only end when Iran ends its effort to acquire nuclear weapons, and we can verify this action with full and total confidence. We know this Iranian regime has misled the international community for years, claiming only peaceful intentions while installing thousands of advanced centrifuges and building a heavy water reactor at Iraq. It is time to put Iran to the test. Any agreement, partial or full, should do this. Iran must immediately come clean about its entire nuclear program. Iran should respond to the evidence of its nuclear weapons program by granting immediate access to Parchin, the hidden military site that has yet to be open to international inspectors, and it should mothball Iraq, the heavy water plant that will accelerate the weapons program. With diplomatic talks resuming in seven days, I urge our Senate colleagues to continue to advance new sanctions legislation. It is the crushing economic sanctions that force the Iranians on a march to the negotiating table. Tougher sanctions will not, as some have suggested, rule out a diplomatic resolution. They will strengthen our ability to get one that ends Iran's nuclear program. This regime must know exactly what is at stake if diplomacy fails. I yield back. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to continue to explore the details of the reported agreement. Uh, I know that Secretary Kerry is over in the Senate today briefing uh, colleagues there, and reports are that Under Secretary Sherman and Cohen will brief the Senate Banking Committee again tomorrow. Uh, I hope that this committee uh, will also be briefed on the specifics of the proposal uh, in the appropriate, uh, appropriate location at the appropriate time, uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, I'd like to just touch on the broader question of what the Iranians' intentions are with their nuclear program. And I'd like to move a bit beyond the back and forth over they want the right to enrich, there's no right to enrich, and, and take them at their word for a moment. And if the, if the Iranians are, are truly committed to a peaceful nuclear program, how much, Dr. Call, let me ask you this question, uh, how much low enriched uranium would they need to operate the one reactor in, that it exists in, in Iran? The answer is, under, under uh, the, the current relationship they have with Russia, they don't need any low-enriched uranium because they get the fuel from Russia. That's, that's right. But I, the, okay. the issue is, and the challenge for our negotiators is, that this is a regime that has spent between $1 and $200 billion on its nuclear infrastructure. And more importantly, its entire ideology is rooted around a resistance to arrogant external powers and the notion that their nuclear rights are, are, are inviolable. Now, I don't agree with that. And I suspect you don't either from your right. comments. Right. But we have to negotiate with the enemies we have, not the I enemies we I want. Underst I understand that. But we also have, but we also have to acknowledge uh, what the facts are surrounding the arguments made by the people sitting across the table. And, and I, I'd simply suggest that, uh, that there is, if we take them at their word that, in fact, there's no desire for a nuclear weapon, they don't, they don't need any more, they don't need any uh, enriched uranium. But I, understanding why they want to be able to enrich, why not come clean about the rest of the program? Why not respond to IAEA investigations of the possible military dimensions of the program, or the designs of triggers, or let inspectors into Parchin? Why not, why not ship out the advanced centrifuges, since that's, those aren't necessary for them to be able to enrich and have nuclear power? Why allow the construction of Iraq to continue for another six months which puts us in a very dangerous position that it lets Iraq get closer and closer uh, to going online, even as we continue to negotiate. Uh, there was a report this morning that said Iraq would be capable of producing enough weapons-grade plutonium for a nuclear, one nuclear weapon per year. Uh, why, as part of all this, in, instead of simply accepting the response that we sometimes get that we're not interested in nuclear weapons and there's a fatwa against nuclear weapons, um, why not, as part of these negotiations, as part of any deal, preliminary or final, why not have them respond to all of the, the allegations, the possible military dimensions that we all know about that the international community is well aware of? So I, th I think proliferation scholars would say that what they're engaged in is what is a nuclear hedging strategy. That is, they are definitely trying to put all the pieces in place to develop nuclear weapons at some point in the future if the leader decides to do no, so. Dr. Call, I'm sorry, no, no, but I, I'm not asking, I, I don't want to speculate. That's my point. I don't want to speculate. I don't want nuclear, no, let me just finish. I don't want nuclear scholars to speculate about what they may or may not be doing. As a, if we're putting in place, if the goal is to put in place a deal, a diplomatic solution, which I support, if we can get to one that works. I think all of us do. If that's, the, if that's where we're trying to go, 
why not as part of that expect them to res and, and, and require them to respond to all of the things that they've done that have caused us to pass sanctions legislation bill after bill over the years? I think we should. Uh, I think that, I think that uh, we shouldn't trust them. We shouldn't, shouldn't trust the fatwa or take them at their word. The entire purpose of, of negotiations is to put in place meaningful and verifiable constraints on their nuclear program to assure all of us that they'll never go for a nuclear weapon. That's the goal of diplomacy. The question, though, is should we go all in on an optimal deal that's likely not achievable and could result in a collision and a no, war? No, I understand. Or should we go for a deal that's possible and also meets our national interests? I, I understand, but I'm, I'm trying to get beyond. We've, been go, we've gone back and forth on that. I, I understand that that's the, part, that's the way any negotiation works. My question is what seems to be missing, or, or, and, but I don't know, I, I, I don't know because uh, it's not been confirmed, but what seems to be missing is, is that requirement that, look, if you want a deal, then, then at least come clean on all of these other aspects. Sit and tell us, respond to every question. Um, let us have full access to Parcheen. Let us uh, uh, tell us what, you're, what you've been doing that has prompted the IAEA to continue to point out the possible military aspects of your program. Why is that too much to ask? It's not too much. I think in the final deal, the comprehensive deal that the administration wants to negotiate over the next six to 12 months, they would have to come clean on the past military dimensions of the program. And I should say, they are in ongoing negotiations with the IAEA on those facilities. I so I know Why shouldn't they have to do that now, at the outset, as part of any preliminary deal? Well, I think because the things that the initial deal has to address are the most urgent risks of a nuclear breakout. They're 20 percent material, they're advanced centrifuges, the loading of fuel assemblies into the Arak uh, reactor, mm -hmm. freezing centrifuge installation, uh, putting in place more intrusive inspections in Fordo and Natanz, because I think the urgent aspects of the program have to be addressed first, and that's what the administration appears to be doing. Okay. We go to uh, Mr. Dana Rohrabacher of California.